Hello, online worshiping friends. Would you join with me in a word of prayer? Gracious God, by the power of your Holy Spirit, open our stubborn hearts and calm our distracted minds so as the scriptures are read, we may hear the word beyond the words and respond with our lives. Amen. This morning, as we wrap up our Can I Ask That sermon series, we're exploring the topic of mental health, what does our faith in Jesus have to do, have to say to our mental health and our mental well-being? Now, mental health is a very broad category, for, and for many of us, when we hear the term mental health, we sort of have a stigma attached to it, and we imagine that that is something that other people deal with. The image of a homeless person rambling to themselves in downtown Asheville or a patient in a hospital like my wife used to work in come to mind. We might say, that's not us, preacher. That's not one of our problems. Indeed, while images, while these images are of people who are living with extreme mental health disorders, mental health also applies to feelings of burnout Anxiety, depression, suicidal ideations, and overall happiness. And that's more of what we are talking about today. And I think that's something that most all of us can relate to. Because studies show that one in five adults in the United States lives with at least some, is diagnosed with some form of a mental health condition. That doesn't count for all the people who have symptoms of these conditions. In fact, the statistics in our state are even higher. In February of 2021, 44.7% of adults in North Carolina reported symptoms of anxiety or depression. That's almost half. Over 15% of youth in our state reported these same symptoms of anxiety or depression. And nationwide, the COVID-19 pandemic and everything else that has happened in the last few years have only heightened these numbers. It was last reported mid-pandemic that three out of four adults in the United States experienced various levels of burnout. In 2022, 42% of clergy, 42% of pastors in the United States strongly considered leaving ministry due to burnout. Now, even if you have not experienced any symptoms of anxiety or depression or even or, or, or burnout and sadness, just as all of us have physical health that we have to work at and maintain, so too do all of us have mental health that needs to be cherished, worked on, and maintained. Part of this cherishing and maintaining for many involves seeing a professional, talking to a counselor. And sometimes if their symptoms are severe enough, they will be prescribed medicine to help treat their condition. Many people look to various strategies such as meditation, yoga, and breathing to help with their overall mental well-being. And our question today is how can we make faith a part of our treatment plan? What does God have to say to us as we go through life and face all of these things, burnout, depression, anxiety, and as we seek to maintain our mental well-being? Well, to explore this question, to explore how our faith can inform us, we're going to look at a story from the Old Testament of a hero of faith who went through his own time of crisis, his own valley of sadness, and from how God treats him, what God prescribes to him, perhaps we will find a thing or two about what God might prescribe for us. And to do this, we'll be looking at the story of the prophet Elijah from 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 1 through 16. May these words be channels of grace into your hearts. King Ahab told Queen Jezebel, all that the prophet Elijah had done, and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. 
Then Queen Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So may the gods do to me and more also, if I do not make your life like the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Then Elijah was afraid. He got up and he fled for his life. And he came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. And he left his servant there. But he himself went on a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a solitary broom tree. And he asked that he might die. It is enough now, O Lord, take my life away, for I am no better than my ancestors. Then Elijah lay down under the broom tree and fell asleep. But suddenly an angel touched Elijah and said to him, Get up and eat. Elijah looked, and there at his head was a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. Elijah ate and drank, and he lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came a second time, touched him, and said, Get up and eat, otherwise this journey will be too much for you. So Elijah got up and ate and drank, and he went out into the strength of that food for 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, to the Mount of God. At that place, he came to a cave and spent the night there. And then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, What are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah answered, Well, I've been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the Israelites have forsaken your covenant. They've thrown down your altars. They've killed your prophets with the sword. And I alone am left. And they are seeking my life. To take it away. God said to Elijah there in the cave, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord's about to pass by. Now there is a great wind, so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard the sheer silence, he wrapped his face up in his mantle and he went out and he stood at the entrance of the cave. Then there came a voice to him that said, again, what are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah answered the same, I've been very zealous for the Lord. And the Israelites have forsaken your covenant. They've, 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 they've thrown down your altars. They've killed your prophets with the sword. I'm, I alone am left. And they're seeking my life to take it away. And the Lord said to Elijah, Go return on your way to Damascus. When you arrive, you shall anoint Hazal as king over Aram. Also, you shall anoint Yehu, son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. And you shall anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, as prophet in your place. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. It is enough now. O oh Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. Would you believe me if I told you that prior to this scripture, prior to this moment of utter darkness and despair, the prophet Elijah was coming off the greatest series of victories of faith ever apart from from Jesus. Elijah's resume is second to none. Just prior to this scripture, Elijah had defeated the rival prophets of Baal as God rained fire down from heaven. 
And Elijah, through this action, led the entire nation of Israel back to faith in the Lord. Billy Graham may have had his revivals and his crusades. Jesus may have preached to the masses. John Wesley may have built tons of hospitals and churches. But only Elijah can say that he converted an entire nation back to the Lord. And if that were not enough, Elijah's accomplishments also would be speaking a famine into existence and raising up a child from the dead. As far as prophets go, Elijah is on top of the world. Successful is an understatement. And yet... It's enough now, O oh Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. How do we get here? Well, as we saw in our scripture, Queen Jezebel, the queen of Israel, is trying to kill Elijah. After he humiliated her and her husband and her religion of Baal, Jezebel has it out for him. And the prophet Elijah is terrified. He's running for his life. Scripture says he flees all the way down to Beersheba, which is all the way at the southern tip of Judah. Elijah's great victory that I was just telling you about over the prophets of Baal was at Mount Carmel. That's at the northern tip of Israel. Elijah has run all the way across the country and crossed the border and gone as far south as he can. He's fled literally to the other end of the country, fearing how Jezebel will retaliate against him. Now, for all of his victories, the prophet Elijah has had his fair share of adversities. He has persevered through them all. He has held the faith strong through them all. So I'm not really sure why it is that this little threat from Queen Jezebel is the straw that broke the camel's back. But something in the prophet seems to have snapped this morning. And I think what's going on is that Elijah's mental health is in crisis. I don't want to diagnose Elijah. I would leave that to professionals like my wife. But Elijah is exhibiting many signs of a crisis. The first sign is that Elijah is worn out. If you look back in Scripture at his story in the book of 1 Kings, for the past few years of his life, Elijah has been on an all-encompassing, never-ending spiritual battle. And I think he's just tired. I think he's spread too thin. He's physically and emotionally exhausted. Perhaps like you are as you watch this video, as you work a full-time job, and you care for your children or your grandchildren, your, your aging parent. As you or your loved ones spend much time in the hospital, much time going back and forth between the doctor receiving treatment, much time meeting with lawyers and taking care of so much endless paperwork. As you work many hours as you can to make ends meet, as you try to keep up with all the things that your young pastor is trying to make you do, Elijah also strikes me as the kind of person who believes that the entire world rests on his shoulders. That he has to be everything to everyone. That he can't take a day off because everybody's counting on him. The nation of Israel is depending on him. Oh my gosh, Elijah's worn out. Elijah's worn out. And that's not all that he has going on for him. Did you notice what he does in verse 3? He's got a servant, a friend who's been traveling with him, and Elijah abandons him. Elijah shuts himself off from other people. How many times when we're overwhelmed, when we're going through something, do we shut ourselves off from other people? Now, let me be clear. As an only child and as an introvert, there are moments where I need to be alone, and that rests me, and that recharges me, but that's not what I'm talking about here Elijah is clearly in distress. And rather than turning to his friends, turning to his loved ones, turning to his church for support, he's hiding away. He's saying, no one's ever gone through what I've been through. Nobody will understand what's going on. 
And maybe Elijah, he, he might have a point. Perhaps he's worried that his friend will say something like, man up, quit acting like a baby. You just need to think positive thoughts. You need to pray those feelings away. Indeed, we don't always say the right things when our friends are going through hard times and will cause more harm than good with our words. We need to remember that simply offering your presence in a listening ear is oftentimes more than enough. That's not all he has going on, though. The most telling sign for us that something is wrong, of course, is that Elijah wants to die. He doesn't want to go on anymore. Take away my life, O oh Lord. He can't see a way out. In this moment, he is overcome by this suffocating sense of darkness. And he has lost sight of not only all that he has accomplished, all who he is, all the people who love him, but also just the fact that his life is precious to God. Anytime somebody starts talking like Elijah is here, it's a sign that some serious help is needed. And it's not only that. Elijah is also so overwhelmed in this moment that his view of reality is just a tad distorted. In his mind, things are a little bit worse than they actually are. We see that in verse 10 when he starts telling God what's happened. Everything Elijah says is a negative exaggeration of the truth or just not true at all. Elijah says everything is awful. The Israelites have forsaken your covenant, which is the exact opposite of the truth. The Israelites are back to having faith in God because of Elijah. He says they've thrown down your altars which Elijah had worked on repairing, and the people were beginning to repair after they came back to God. Elijah says they've killed your prophets with the sword, which is sort of true, but he's misplacing the blame. Queen Jezebel did that, not the people. And then he says, I alone am left. I'm on my own, which is also not true, because if you read a few chapters back, the prophet Obadiah saved a hundred priests of the Lord, even though he feels like it. Elijah's not alone. Now, some might say, well, this, this, this prophet Elijah guy sounds like a, just a negative Nelly. He's having himself a pity party. But I'll tell you, when sometimes when we're under extreme duress, extreme stress, under mental strain, it's easy to lose your grounding in reality and for everything to appear to be much worse than it is. Does that ever happen to you? I'll tell you, I'm the worst at this. My counselor's always having to say to me whenever I'm overwhelmed, whenever I'm convinced that something is hopeless and a waste of my time, she'll say to me, now Drew, is that a feeling that you have? Or is that an actual fact? Things are never gonna get better. I'm always gonna be stuck in this situation. I'm never going to get that promotion. My kids will never come to Christ. I'm too old to make a difference. My life, is have, my life has no meaning anymore. Is that a feeling or a fact? Elijah is caught up in feelings, and he's having a moment of crisis, a moment of crisis that surely you can relate to in some way. And as Elijah's having this mental breakdown, this debilitating experience that he can't see a way out of. God speaks to him. God cares for him. And God prescribes some things to help nurture Elijah's mental health. And there are three things that God does for the prophet Elijah that he also does for you and me today. Three things that build you up. Three things that you can make a part of your treatment plan. And the first thing that God does for you and Elijah is this. God says, eat and rest. Eat and rest. I love this tender, beautiful, motherly scene we get in verses 4 through 9. Elijah says he wants to die, and he's so exhausted that he just passes out under a broom tree. And you know what God does? God lets Elijah sleep. God lets Elijah take a nap. 
And then God sends an angel to Elijah and taps him on the shoulder and he wakes him up with a cake baked on hot stones and a jug of water. God is anything like my mother. He would have sent a plate of hot chocolate chip cookies and a glass of milk. And, Elijah, and God has Elijah go back to sleep for another nap. There's no rebuke. There's no sermon. There's no, you should have more faith. You should read the Bible more. You should do this, you should do that. No. God gives Elijah chocolate chip cookies and a nap. Eat and rest. Rest. You know, our culture today is, is, is all about working hard and, and being on call 24-7 and working our fingers to the bone. And I think we have a hard time with rest. Rest is seen as something that is lazy and that we should feel guilty for. How many of us, when we're on vacation, have trouble getting into that vacation, have trouble disconnecting from our devices, turning our brains off. I mean, heck, how many of you have trouble turning your brains off when you get home at night at 5 o'clock? But you know, even God himself rested. On the seventh day of creation, God stopped everything, rested, Maybe God took a nap and had some chocolate chip cookies. Who knows if even the infinite almighty God needed to rest. I see no reason why you and anyone else should not have the same thing. If God is not a 24-7 God, then we were not made to be 24-7 people. We were made to rest too. And rest is sacred. Rest is holy. And I can hear the protests coming from behind the screen already. I've got to get this done. It won't happen without me. I, I got to do just one more thing. Trust me, I know that all too well. Preachers are the worst at taking care of themselves. But here's the thing. It doesn't matter if the clothes sit dirty in the floor for one more night. It doesn't matter if you have to skip a Bible study meeting one week. It doesn't matter if everything in your life is not spiff, spam, and perfect. What matters is that you are taking care of yourself. What matters is that you are resting. What matters is that you are well. So take the nap and eat the chocolate chip cookies. Now the second thing that God does for you and Elijah is this God speaks in a gentle whisper God speaks in a gentle whisper in our scripture Elijah has made his way to Mount Horeb you're familiar with Mount Horeb it's also known as Mount Sinai it's where God appeared to Moses and the Israelites and it's where God gave them the Ten Commandments from Mount Horeb is a place where God shows up in spectacular ways. And I think that's why Elijah has journeyed there. He's used to God showing up in spectacular ways, raining fire down from heaven, declaring famine on the land, resurrecting the dead. And Elijah's looking for answers. He's searching for meaning. He's searching for hope. And what better place to do that than a place like Mount Horeb? And he's expecting to find something mind-blowing, something so fulfilling and clear that it leaves no doubt that he know his mind will be healed. He's looking for God in all the familiar places. And it looks like at first that he's going to get that. In verse 11, there's a great wind so strong that it splits the mountains and breaks the rocks. And then there's an earthquake and then there's a fire. But the Lord, we're told, is in none of these. God is nowhere to be found where Elijah has come to expect him to be. God is nowhere to be found in the spectacular. It's only after the dust settles and everything is quieted down that Elijah meets the Lord. And it's in the sound of a sheer silence. Whereas the King James translates it, a still, small voice. 
In Hebrew, that phrase is kol demama deka. Say that one at home with me. Kol demama deka. My translation of that is a gentle whisper. A gentle whisper. God is in the sheer silence. The still, small voice. The gentle whisper. Where is it that you hear God's gentle whisper? In times of crisis like Elisha, we, we tend to want God to speak loudly, to shout, to show up in a grandiose way that there's no mistaking it. But I think it's when we're at our lowest that God will speak the softest to us. I've really struggled this week with how to put into words what that means for my life. Because I think we all hear the gentle whisper of God differently. But in my life, in times of crisis, when the spectacular, supernatural experiences are not happening, when all the usual disciplines of religion are yielding no fruit, and I begin to feel ashamed and abandoned, that gentle whisper comes in the form of an Instagram message from a former youth saying, I'm thinking of you. And I just wanted to let you know, I thought about something you said to me the other day, and it made a difference in my life. It comes in the form of Walter the cat, who every time I walk through the front door will be there to greet me and tries to climb up on my legs. It's not good for my clothes, but it reminds me that I'm loved. It comes in the form of the taste of a cup of morning coffee, as the world is still waking up and I'm reminded that we are to experience the joys, experience joy and beauty in this life. It's hard to put into words what it means for God to speak in a gentle whisper. But know this, God speaks to each of us this way. He speaks to you this way. And when we can ground ourselves in the gentle whispers of God, rather than relying on the earthquakes, the fires, and the winds, we will begin to see ourselves and our lives the way that God does. We will know that we never walk alone. We will know the truth. Which brings us to the final thing that God does for us and the prophet Elijah, which, which is this. God believes in you. God believes in you. At the beginning of our scripture, in his moment of crisis, Elijah has been believing all of the lies. I'm no better than my ancestors. The world would be better off without me. Everything I've ever done has failed. There's no way that things can get better. It's all just too much. Elijah's believing all the lies, but God speaks to him the truth. And by the end of our scripture, God has given Elijah a new task. God has told him to get back up on the path to get back into the game. God has not discarded Elijah or given up on Elijah. God has not questioned his commitment. God has not dwelled on his shortcomings. God has not made Elijah feel ashamed for what he is going through. But God has simply shown to him compassion and care. And now he's calling on him to keep on going. I have a new job for you, Elijah. There's something for you yet to do. And Elijah's task is to train up his successor to bring up the next generation of prophets. And quite frankly, I think that this low point in Elijah's life is what qualifies him to be a teacher because he can pass on the lessons of compassion and care that he has just learned from God. And I think that perspective is so important for us, friends, because when we get down, when we're burnt out, when we go through those seasons of darkness, sometimes these things can snowball and we can feel guilt and shame for being in a low moment in life. But here's the thing. Our God is a God who brings out the best in his people. A God who is relentlessly committed to you, even when you want to give up, even when you don't see a way out. 
If you are yet alive, God still believes in you. God still has something for you to do. God still has plans for you to be a blessing. Even when you don't, he believes in you. God cares for your mental health, your mental well-being. When doubts, despair, shame, and worry darken your skies, when all you hear is a course of lies, know that our God is on your side. He tells you to eat and to rest. He speaks to you gently, softly, and he believes in you. Because you're precious to him. You are of infinite value, infinite worth to him. May you never, ever lose sight. That. Amen.